بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of God most compassionate most merciful uh, and I greet you with the universal Islamic greeting of assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all I often get asked a very important question by both Muslims and also by young Muslims uh, are you an Australian Muslim or are you a Muslim Australian and personally I find that question problematic and somewhat insulting because I see both to be complementary and not incompatible. And sometimes young Australian Muslims uh, who have grown up in this country, perhaps because of the onslaught against Islam, perhaps because they grew up in, a, in an atmosphere of Islamophobia, and perhaps because they grew up in an atmosphere of marginalization, they begin to question their own identity. And so they struggle with the question of, can I be a Muslim? and an Australian at the same time. And I say to them, and I often start this conversation with them, is that, is it okay to be a Palestinian Muslim, or a Lebanese Muslim, or a Pakistani Muslim, or an Indian Muslim, or an Arab Muslim? And obviously the response usually is that, yes, of course we can. And they see no contradictions in that. But for some reason they see there is some contradiction between being Muslim and Australian. And today I want to be able to hopefully explain to you that there are no contradictions between both. And in fact, I would even argue that to deny our Australianness is to deny Islam's long historical presence in this nation of ours. At the outset, let me say that Muslim scholars have always understood that Islam did not intend to Arabize people. And that is a very important point to understand. Islam did not seek to commit what some people call cultural apostasy. Cultural apostasy means if you become a Muslim, therefore you abandon all the cultural practices that you have. Or that if you become a Muslim, therefore you deny your own uh, natural customary practices that are deemed useful, beneficial, and merely harmless. And so that is a very important point. Islam did not intend to Arabize people, but rather it managed rather beautifully to allow people who have accepted Islam, whether they were in Africa or Indonesia or Malaysia, to beautifully infuse, if you like, the universal Islamic teachings of the oneness of God and so forth with their local customs and practices, which were deemed useful, beneficial, and merely harmless. And I capitalize on this point of being useful, and beneficial, and merely harmless because the general understanding of Islam and Muslim scholars is that any practice that is seen as useful, beneficial, and merely harmless can easily become incorporated into an Islamic identity. And that is why you find that the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he did not reject all the customs of the Arabs when he declared that he was a prophet, but rather as many great scholars of the past, jurists of the past, like Imam Abu Hanifa, the great scholar, uh, and his students, they said, in fact, part of the sunnah of the prophet or the, the way of life of the prophet Muhammad, it incorporated, in fact, many of the existing Arab customs and practices, given that they were not directly contradictory to the Islamic teachings of, say, the oneness of God and so forth. And he merely rejected some of those practices that went against the teachings of Islam. For example, the Arabs before Islam were excessive in their drinking. They loved alcohol. They loved, loved intoxicants. They were not fair to women. They did not allow women to inherit property, for example. They used to be oppressive in many cases to women. They used to bury their daughters alive. And so Islam came and rejected those practices, but it continued to uphold some of the cultural practices of the Arabs that Islam saw to be useful. So for example, egalitarianism or caring for one another. And the same thing happened when Islam expanded. And when it went to Africa, Islam looked African. And when Islam went to China, it looked Chinese. And when Islam went to Asia, it looked Asian. What do I mean by that? 
if you were to look at the simple uh, example, but not simplistic, of even architecture, you find that when Islam spread to places like Africa, the very nature of the architecture of their mosques or building acquired a cultural taste that is distinct to the people of Africa. And when Islam spread to China, you find that the mosques in China acquired a distinct style of architecture that is unique to Chinese culture. In fact, if you look at some of the very old Chinese mosques, they look from outside like temples. But when you walk inside, you find that they actually are mosques. Why? Because Islam and Islamic law indeed is flexible enough to allow us to infuse multiple identities without compromising the essential practices of the faith. If you looked at the very concept of modesty, for example, which Islam advocates for both men and women, you find that the interpretation and manifestation of hijab or the headgear for women, the head covering, in Africa it looked African, in China it looked Chinese, in, in Asia it looked Asian. And so Islam has universal laws, universal values that can be practiced anywhere. And you can infuse within that certain aspects of any culture, as long as they are useful, beneficial, and merely harmless. In fact, it is known historically that one of the reasons Islam succeeded in spreading out so quickly to different nations, not because of the sword, but because of its ability to appropriate local customs and practices that were compatible with Islam. So much so that uh, Muslim scholars and jurists, before deriving a particular law, a legal law, or a legal principle, they looked at what is known as urf and ada, customary practices and cultures of people. So I like to speak about the idea of positive identity. This is what some contemporary scholars talk about. Islam allows us to have a, a positive identity. Wherever you are, you must have a positive identity. And a positive identity means you can be Australian and Muslim at once, incorporating the teachings of Islam and the good, beneficial, and merely harmless aspects of any culture, in this case, Australian culture. And if you really look at the many, many aspects of Australian culture, they are compatible with, with what Islam says, the values of Islam. I'm not talking about things such as, for example, drinking or alcoholism or drug abuse, because we mustn't see these as peculiar or specific to Australian culture. You can go to any country now and find people drinking or there is drug abuse universally. But if you look at, dig deeper and look at the other beautiful aspects of Australian culture, caring for others, free education, healthcare, egalitarianism, a good taste for architecture or art. These can easily be infused in one's own identity as an Australian. In fact, I also always say to young Australian Muslims, if you, if you deny your Australianness, you are denying a long-standing historical presence of Islam in Australia. What do I mean by that? At least 200 years before European settlement of Australia, Makassans from Salawasi, Indonesia, in about 1650s, some people say the 1750s, came to this country before any other white settlement. And they traded with the indigenous or Aboriginal community of Australia. They used to buy and sell tripang or sea cucumbers. And there is substantial archaeological and anthropological evidence to tell us that the relationship between uh, Makassans or Indonesians, Muslims, who came in the 1650s, and that with the Aborigines of Australia was very positive. Then if you fast forward and you move to the 1850s, you find that the Cameliers or Muslims from uh, Baluchistan and Afghanistan, some from Pakistan, came or were brought, in fact, with their camels and helped lay down the railway foundation of the interior of Australia. Essentially, the Muslim cameleers in the 1850s came and connected Australia from within through the railway systems that they had introduced. And so these are long-standing historical presence of Islam. And what I find interesting is that recently, a number of coins were found, I think it was in Darwin, and 
After 40 years or so, some investigation uh, or research, academic research is being looked at these coins and led by Professor Nonezi in Macintosh. These coins, seven or eight coins were found uh, and they found that they had Arabic writings on the back of these coins. And after some research, they realized that these coins are probably a thousand years old. On the back of these coins, it says Sultanate Bani Kilwa. It is the Sultanate of a, uh, the tribe of Kilwa, which was in Tanzania about a thousand years ago. And now there is a, an assumption, a proposition that, that is still being worked at, that perhaps, in fact, there was contact with Islam a thousand years ago here in this country, Australia. So we do not see an incompatibility between being Australian and Muslim. Rather, a person should be, or Islam advocates, the very idea of unique cultural tastes and styles. And that to be a Muslim, one does not have to be uniform. One does not have to be Arabized, but rather infuse the beautiful cultural norms, the beneficial, useful, merely harmless cultural values of any country, of any nation, and make that part and parcel of an Islamic identity. That does not go against religious loyalties, but rather it advocates, in fact, or speaks volumes about what Islam talks of natural loyalties, love for one's own nation, love for one's own people, and love for one's own cultures, practices that are compatible with the universal laws and values of Islam. With this, I say, especially to the young Australian Muslims. Do not feel that there is an incompatibility between being Australian and Muslim. Rather, they are beautifully infused and they are two sides of one coin. Thank you so much.